welcome back to the next lecture so what we have been doing in the past you know 3 4 lectures is to figure out how to generate an enolit or an enol as the case may be and we have also looked at the possibility of you know doing what is known as an aldol reaction where we react either an aldehyde with itself or we react a ketone with itself or or if you mix and match the reactivity appropriately then you may uh, react you know an aldehyde with the ketone and so on okay so however i hope uh, you will understand so far that we still have some ambiguity in the whole uh, process because for example if i pick any aldehyde and if i wanted to react with ketone for example where i generate the enolate from the ketone it is going to be challenging to do it with the methods that we have looked at so far so therefore typically when you do an aldol reaction so you have a component a and if it's of course reacting with itself it's not a problem but you have a component b and so let's say a is the enolate and b is the electrophile okay so now problem is that you need to no sort of figure out the reactivity of a and b properly so for example the electrophile doesn't have any enolizable hydrogen at all okay so the examples that we have looked at for example this tertiary butyl aldehyde okay so there is no choice here right so therefore the enolate can only be produced from a and then the enolate reacts with this aldehyde and so on alternatively you know you can also mix you can have a electrophile that has an enolizable hydrogen but it should not be very reactive that is a should be much more enolizable than b so these are some criteria that we have looked at so far but in order to solve this problem of trying to mix and match we generate what are known as specific enol equivalents okay now we have looked at this earlier in the semester and for example generating an enolate under certain special conditions we can do it so what these are basically these are intermediates that have the reactivity of the enolates have reactivity the key keyword here is reactivity of enolates okay but are stable enough to be prepared and used is so unlike an enolate traditional enolate you know they are quite unstable these enol equivalents can be even stored if needed so and also the critical part is that they have to produce the product in good yield okay so these are some criteria that we look at for specific enol equivalents it will become clear and as we go forward what these are okay so the first example of a specific enol equivalent is a lithium enolate okay so what we do here is we start with this molecule called as lda which is as is write it out here so this is di isopropyl mean now when i react this with butyl lithium in thf okay so this is the proton that is going to be abstracted and we end up with n li okay and this is called as lithium diisopropyl amine okay and of course the product that you get is butane which i'm just going to write it as buh so this is a very very important and of course this reaction is carried out at pretty low temperatures like 0 degree centigrade and so lda is a stable base it can be made it can be stored you know at low temperatures it can also be prepared when you want to in the lab you have to be very careful of course because the protonation of lda is actually quite exothermic so it is very very commonly used in organic chemistry labs 
as a deprotonating agent. Now, the important thing about LDA is also that, you know, because of this two diisopropyl groups, this nitrogen is actually not a nucleophilic center. Okay, so it is considered as a non nucleophilic or poorly nucleophilic base. Okay, so the idea here is that, you know, especially in this case, you, you don't want this to be reacting as a nucleophile. So you would much prefer that it reacts as a base. So this is one of the examples of a non nucleophilic base. So when we take LDA or when we take a ketone, you know, what we do is we take a, for example, a solution of the ketone. So you normally keep this under nitrogen atmosphere. So you take your, you add your ketone, you charge the, the reaction vessel with some of the aldehyde and then what you do is you carefully distill out THF. So your THF is here. Okay, so THF you freshly distill it and you, you cover this with what is known as a septum. I think all of you know what a septum is and so this keeps it airtight and now with the help of a syringe and a needle you pull out the THF from here to the adequate whatever volume you need and then that you now transfer it to this container. So once you transfer it, you have this much amount of, for example, THF. And now what you do is, I'm just going to write it in the next page. All this while you keep it under nitrogen atmosphere. So one of the ways to do that is actually to use you know, a two-neck flask. So this is kept under constant flow of nitrogen on this and you can do all your transfers from here. Okay. So here is your ketone or aldehyde with uh, THF in it. So carbonyl plus THF. Okay. Now what you do is you keep it under a, in a trough uh, which contains, you know, dry ice and acetone. So dry ice is uh, basically you get these chunks of dry ice, which is basically uh, CO2, solid CO2. Okay, and acetone. Acetone is very widely used in organic chemistry labs. So you mix this uh, dry ice and acetone in this. And uh, what it does is it's a very, very inexpensive way of maintaining low temperatures. Specifically, the temperature that we are looking at is around minus 78 degrees centigrade. and uh, so what this does is that once you put this uh, two-necked RB into the trough which contains dry ice and acetone, then the THF gets cooled down and you are maintaining a very low temperature. Of course, you can also insert a thermometer here just to look at what temperature it is at. You can also insert a thermometer, right? You can also have an external thermometer to find out what the external temperature is. So this is a pretty standard practice. That that is followed in organic chemistry labs. And what you need to do is, you know, you need to give a little bit of time for the THF to, to acquire the temperature that you wish. So you may need to give 5 to 10 minutes time. And one way to monitor the internal temperature, of course, as I mentioned, is to use a thermometer. And then to this reaction vessel, what you do is you, you can add LDA to it. And so the reaction now is basically, let's say we take this plus LDA, okay, at minus 78 degrees, right? And what we expect here is the following, okay? So we have C double bond O, H, and you have your nitrogen. Inhalate here and there's a nitrogen base here. And what can happen is uh, you have the abstraction of hydrogen followed by the uh, reaction of the oxygen with uh, lithium. And uh, you get the product as R O L I double bond. 
and of course the byproduct is uh, diisopropylamine and so this is one very good way to generate the enolate so in this reaction vessel as you recall we now have the ketone and we have added LDA and uh, you know you can measure out uh, exact equivalence of the LDA that you are adding and you can very carefully generate the enolate maybe in 20-30 minutes or so depending on the reaction. So what you do is you maintain this whole vessel at minus 78 degrees centigrade and then you know now I will give you another piece of information or another possibly experimental situation that you may deal with. So here is your reaction vessel and here is the bath at minus 28 degrees okay and now you have uh, the ketone and LDA in this. So you have based on prior experience or based on a reported protocol you know how much of uh, time it takes for the enolate to be produced. And now what you do is uh, you can predetermine this. You have what is known as an addition funnel. So the addition funnel is nothing but an addition that goes here. You have a, a small tap. You can add your reagent. Now you again have a septum over here and you can add whatever reagent that you want. Let's say here is the aldehyde. Okay. In THF again. And what you can do is to also maintain the THF here at low temperature. There are ways to do it. But as a concept, what we would do is we would prepare the solution of uh, the aldehyde and THF. And then when you open this, uh, you know, there could be a, a tap here as well. And uh, when you open this tap slowly, you will have drops of this aldehyde and THF falling into this. And the moment you are adding this here, the enolate is now exposed to the aldehyde and then the reaction can occur. Okay. Now let's go to the what reaction we are talking about. So the reaction here is uh, R O L I. So let's say we start with the uh, benzaldehyde. So you can have the attack of the carbonyl on this position like this and you get the following. It's a six-membered reaction transition state and you end up with C double bond O and you can imagine that this lithium is coordinating to this carbonyl and you get our new bond that is being formed. O Li. Now there's a, an actual bond between oxygen and lithium and then there is going to be a coordinated bond here. So uh, then what you do is in this to this reaction vessel you wait after the complete addition of the aldehyde you know you wait for about half an hour, one hour or whatever time maybe a couple of hours and then you warm it up to room temperature. The way you warm it up is you remove the dias and acetone and slowly it warms up to room temperature and then at this point you know you need to very very slowly work up the reaction. Okay, so the way you work up the reaction is by adding a few drops of water very carefully. You may want to keep it under ice or at low temperature so that the reaction, whatever remaining base, if there is a small amount of base that is remaining and so on, they are going to react very violently with water. So you are going to do a work up with water very slowly and then you get the aldol product. So, a quick recap on the lithium enolate reaction. You know, so the way we would do this reaction is we would first generate the enolate from using LDA and we would use uh, minus 78 degrees centigrade. And typically, these reactions are carried out. The solvent suggests tetrahydrofuran. So, this gives us the enolate right and then the next step is when we add the aldehyde for example we add benzaldehyde and the product that we get would be okay so this is a, an example 
of the inner light that is produced uh, using LDA. So there's one important aspect of this is that you know this reaction that we carry out at minus 78 degrees it's a pretty much an irreversible reaction okay so what happens is that uh, you know once the enolate is produced it really doesn't go back and give you the starting material so what you normally do is you like we discussed last time is you generate the enolate and then you add uh, the aldehyde dropwise so what it does is that the enolate is quite reactive here and then once it you know, there's a plenty of enolate in solution and there's a small amount of aldehyde that is added and so the reaction would favor the formation of aldol. So now in the continuation with this topic, uh, we shall now look at how to make and you know, how to use what are known as silyl enol ethers. So we have already looked at this in the previous uh, lectures. So silyl enol ethers, we saw them during the production of enols. So the strategy here is that we take a ketone and then react this with you know triethylamine in the presence of uh, SiMe3Cl, which is trimethyl silyl chloride, and what this does is it first gives you the enol and then the enol is going to react and give you the silyl enol ether okay so this is an enol and if you have a methyl group instead of si here that would be an enol ether so this is called a silyl enol ether so sometimes this is also represented as R O T M S, which talks about trimethyl silyl group. Okay, so this is the key reagent in this reaction, and so what we do with the silyl enol ethers is that when you take R O T M S. And then you react it with an aldehyde. Let's say we take benzaldehyde. Okay, there's pretty much no reaction that happens. But when you add in a Lewis acid, if you recall, we have done, you know, for example, electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. We have done in the presence of Lewis acid. So in this case, the Lewis acid that is used is uh, titanium tetrachloride. And then that is step number one. And step number two is just water. And work up. So we get the aldol product. Okay. So this is a wonderful reaction. It works really well. And let's look at the mechanism now. But this was developed by Mukayama and is referred to as the Mukayama aldol reaction. So the strategy that we will use here is to generate a silyl enol ether and then you know use that silyl enol ether and go forward with the aldol reaction. So now let's look at the mechanism. So we have already looked at the mechanism to produce the silyl enol ether. So I am not going to repeat that. So this is your silyl enol ether and now we know that carbonyl compounds can react with Lewis acids and so I'm just going to draw that here. So your benzaldehyde can react with PiCl4 to give you pH C double bond O PiCl3. So this is going to have a full positive charge on it. So this is going to be quite activated. Okay. So if we generate species such as this. Now what we can propose is that the silyl enol ether is activated enough that it would come here, attack here and neutralize that positive charge that we have seen. So the product that we would get is O 
esa eje metri o titanium cl3 is still there and then the ph is still here okay so i'm just going to redraw this in the next page so you can look at it once again right so let me just redraw this intermediate for our convenience c double bond o r o e i c l 3 and ph okay so keep in mind that the silyl group is still here m e m e m e and there's a positive charge over here okay so now we can envisage that this uh, silyl group is quite activated and we have some chloride floating around so chloride can come and attack the silyl group and free up the carbonyl group here and so the product that you would get is r c double bond o oh ph plus si me 3 cl okay so i'm sorry i forgot to keep the titanium chloride on this so the titanium chloride is still here ti cl3 and now we can move to the next slide i'll just draw the intermediate once again so we have r c double bond o o ti cl3 h and you have this trimethyl silyl chloride that is floating around you have chloride which is still present and so you have a, a reaction over here you know which then eventually picks up the silyl group from here and the product that is formed is r c double bond o o sime3 ph okay so and the titanium tetrachloride is also a product that is formed now there are many versions of this mechanism and they all have some common features for example this uh, proposed mechanism you know really may not be completely accurate but you know there are some aspects of this reaction that are important for us to discuss okay so the first one is that if you just add the enol and aldehyde there's no reaction okay so without the lewis acid there is no reaction the enol is extremely stable and the carbonyl group here is not that reactive for it to react and second thing is that the key step in the reaction is the reaction of the silylenol ether with the Lewis acid complex electrophile. That means that so your electrophile is going to be complexed to TiCl3, for example. So now this reaction is the key step in the reaction. So after this, you know, the steps that we discussed, they are of course important, but they are not from a mechanistic standpoint they are not that important. Now let's look at one example. The example that we want to look at is we start with diethyl ketone and if I want to add let's say react this with this aldehyde. So what we would do is step number one would be Cl in the presence of triethylamine Okay. And this is going to generate the TMS, right? And then the next step would be to react it with this aldehyde in the presence of titanium tetrachloride. And that's going to give me the product, the aldol product. And I would urge you to draw it out yourself. That will be, of course, number one would be this, and number two would be water. 